So as you guys know, one of the videos I did that gained a lot of attention was my video on vitamin B17. In case you haven't seen that video, basically a bunch of conspiracy theorists think that the medical industries are purposely withholding cures to cancer and making them illegal so that they can make money off patients. And one of the cures that is being kept secret is amygdalin, or more commonly known as this misnomer, vitamin B17. Now my first video I explained to quite some detail on the biochemistry behind this, why it doesn't treat cancer at all, and why it can actually harm you. So for this video, I might repeat some information from the first. I'll leave a link in the description to my first video for those of you who are interested. Anyway, it's actually an interesting story on why I chose this particular video you will see today for a response. For a while, my video appeared as the number one result when you searched vitamin B17. However, this has recently been surpassed by another video called Why is vitamin B17 illegal? Does vitamin B17 really cure cancer? And since I'm incredibly salty of them taking my number one spot, I decided to make a response. I know you all are excited, so let's get right into it. Is vitamin B17 the greatest cover-up in the history of cancer? Considering that we've done a few clinical trials on vitamin B17 in order to assess its effects on actual cancer patients, no, we haven't done a great job covering it up. Perhaps it's because we don't cover it up. It has been becoming increasingly apparent in recent years that there are a number of alternative cancer treatment methods which have proven to either eradicate cancer cells on their own. No, there's no evidence of these alternative methods working. If there were, it would just be called medicine. What we would need is to have novel treatments proved to be effective in clinical settings in order for it to become accepted. Alternative medicine of any kind has not passed this rigorous testing like other modern treatment methods have or even assist with the more traditional methods of chemotherapy and radiation. Interesting how you acknowledge that chemotherapy and radiation actually work, since you say that some alternative treatments can assist with these. Usually conspiracy theorists completely demonize some accepted treatment methods, so this is a bit different for a start. Many of these alternative treatments do not get the recognition that they deserve from either mainstream media or mainstream medicine. I wonder why. In fact, in many states alternative cancer treatments have been banned or made illegal and, according to the law, one can even be forced to undergo chemotherapy against one's will. Well, they would have to deem you to be mentally incompetent to be able to make your own decisions. And even then, family members or spouses get a huge say. I don't really see a valid point stemming from patients being forced to undergo chemotherapy against their own wills. It is important to note, however, that choosing one of these natural, alternative cancer treatments does require you to do a lot of research, because there is very little funding, or merit, allotted to their study. Okay, sure some of them don't have any funding for clinical trials, but others have already been flat out proven to be ineffective or dangerous. Vitamin B17 is the latter. Certain proposed treatments don't get into the clinical trial phase since that would first require large amounts of peer-reviewed evidence in a lab setting. If you are so adamant on showing us that alternative treatment methods are effective, get a degree in biology and start your own project. You could easily do this and write a paper. Change the world of medicine. What's holding you back? The cancer industry does not want to look at these alternative methods and spends very little of their funds informing people about preventative medicine. Actually, if we wanted to not look at preventative medicine, we wouldn't have developed vaccinations. That's like the king of preventing illnesses. Not to mention that you can't exactly prevent cells from becoming tumorous. Cells can go rogue through a number of factors. You probably know about mutations, how it can activate oncogenes and inhibit tumor suppressors. Essentially, mutations can alter the cells to have a selective survival advantage over regular cells. These genes are specifically called drivers and are mutated by driver mutations. So to prevent this, we would have to stop any type of mutations from happening. And how do we do that? Well, there's no real way to prevent every gene from mutating, which is why looking at cancer from a preventative viewpoint can be pretty useless. But who knows what path medicine will take in the future. In fact, one particular vitamin that is believed to be extremely beneficial in fighting cancer cells has actually been banned by the FDA and is illegal for treatment in the United States, and that is Letril. You know why the FDA banned Laetrile? Because it's dangerous. It's just a precursor to cyanide, really, which can do numerous harm to your body. If you missed the first episode, I explained why cyanide is not so great for you, so feel free to go to that video, which is posted down below. In summary, our bodies are largely dependent on aerobic respiration in order to produce the energy required by cells. This pathway involves breaking down glucose to produce NADH and FADH2, which are migrated to the electron transport chain. These are electron carriers that deposit electrons into a few complexes found in the membrane 
membranes of mitochondria, where the electrons then go through the electron transport chain. The carrier that transports electrons from complex 3 to complex 4 is called cytochrome C. This is important for maintaining the proton gradient and for the electrons to be accepted by oxygen. Cyanide directly inhibits the activity of cytochrome C, which halts the process of this electron transport chain, thus stopping our primary method of ATP production. Now that you know why cyanide is dangerous, you should also understand why laetrile and amygdalin are also dangerous. They readily break down into cyanide in our intestines by beta-glucosidase into cyanide. This is why the FDA banned vitamin B17, not because of whatever reason you have in your head. Literal contains one of the greatest concentrations of vitamin B17 on the planet. Actually no, vitamin B17 is just another name for amygdalin. Amygdalin is basically the same as laetril minus a glucose. So you essentially just said that laetril contains amygdalin. Bravo. And it can be found in the often overlooked seed of a popular fruit, the apricot. I don't understand why you guys are so obsessed with the apricot. Every video I find on this just talks only about apricot seeds as if they're the only ones containing vitamin B17. Vitamin B17 is found in many other seeds too, such as apples, peaches, and almonds. Apricot seeds can be found beneath the hard pit inside the apricot, and many people are unaware that they are both edible and delicious. Neither of those are true and that they contain a cancer-fighting agent called amygdalin within. Amygdalin contains glucose, benzaldehyde, and cyanide, and it is the latter which is believed to be the active cancer-fighting ingredient of letrol. Yeah, so vitamin B17 is hydrolyzed in the intestines into three compounds, glucose, benzaldehyde, and of course cyanide. Like I mentioned earlier, cyanide is extremely toxic to our cells, unlike the other two. Even if it were able to kill cancer cells, it still wouldn't be a valid treatment. A therapeutic must be shown to be both effective and safe for the consumer in order to be recognized as actual medicine. It is important to note, however, that cyanide is actually toxic to all cells which makes the overall toxicity of lateral a concern. Yes, usually things that are toxic to cancer cells are also toxic to normal cells. After all, they are just normal cells that have gone rogue. So something like cyanide that inhibits cytochrome C would attack both good and bad cells. In many cases, however, a treatment may only attack healthy cells and not cancer cells, since cancer can be extremely resistant to many environments, especially cancer stem cells. Cyanide is an example of this. It has been shown that normal cells are much more sensitive since cancer can depend more on lactate fermentation via the Warburg effect. So I'm gonna have to disagree with what you said. Yet studies suggest that letteral is more toxic to cancer cells than to normal cells. I've actually seen a few papers that concludes this. However, they were simple research studies. They experimented in vitro and in mice. Not saying that these methods are unreliable, but not everything studied through them can be translated directly to humans, which is why we ran that clinical trial. It resulted in patients being pulled out due to cyanide poisoning as well as having no effect on shrinking tumor sizes. After all, your chances of getting cyanide poisoning from apple seeds or almonds are extremely slim. That's because the lethal dose for cyanide is decently high. A lethal dose can be down to a minimum of 1.5 mg per kilograms of body mass. For amygdalin, that value is about 600 mg per kilograms of body mass. Of course, this is different depending on how the amygdalin enters your body. If you ingested it orally, then the lethal dose can be lower due to the fact that beta-glucosidase mainly resides in the small intestines. Therefore, injected amygdalin will tend to stay in its original chemical structure instead of releasing cyanide. And we mustn't forget that cancer is toxic to begin with. Hmm, I wouldn't call cancer toxic, you silly little boy. You may be asking the following question. If B17 is so powerful and helpful towards cancer elimination, then why is it not prescribed by modern physicians as a treatment? Simple answer. A control for cancer is known, and it comes from nature, but it is not widely available to the public because it cannot be patented and therefore is not commercially attractive to the pharmaceutical industry. I don't know what else to say here other than just not true. The reason it's not made available to the public is because of its toxic effects and its inability to actually tackle the problem of cancer. Now for entertainment purposes, I'll tell you some actual ways we are looking at to treat cancer. Immunotherapy is a hot topic right now, just like how angiogenesis was a few decades ago. We are looking more into modifying the immune system. Tumors have very specific ways to evade our immune system through immune checkpoints. For example, T-cells have a particular receptor on their cell membranes called PD-1. These respond to 
PD-1 ligand or PDL1. Once these receptors have been stimulated, T-cell response is inhibited and apoptosis occurs by activating SHP2 phosphatase and inactivating the PI3K kinase pathway. You may think this is quite pointless for an immune cell to have, but moderation is key when it comes to biology. Regulation of the immune system is important to prevent autoimmune diseases. Here's the interesting part. Cancer cells are expressing PDL1 on their membrane surfaces, and once it comes into contact with T-cells, they can evade immune destruction by inhibiting T-cell activity. So knowing this, we can research on the inhibition of PD-1 as a way to keep the immune system active against tumor cells. But of course, this isn't the only way to modify the immune system against cancer. Let's take a look at another one, specifically therapeutic vaccinations. That's right, vaccinations aren't only for prevention, you know. We can inject tumor antigens along with the antigen-presenting cells like the macrophage or dendritic cell. The patient's own immune system can then be altered to attack cancer cells. We can also perform a modified version of this by extracting the lymphocytes and vaccinating it in vitro, then reintroducing them back into the patient. Cool, right? And it gets even cooler once you get more advanced into oncology. Much cooler than the ideas presented by conspiracy theorists. G. Edward Griffin Dr. Sujira's Research Dr. Kane Matsusugura spent the majority of his career at the Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and has authored more than 250 papers. He has also received numerous awards, he specifically studied lateral and discovered that it showed very positive results with preventing malignant lung tumors in laboratory mice. Normally I would look this guy up and read his research paper, but I'm getting a bit lazy. Because even if everything you said were true, it still wouldn't overrule our failure to see any benefits of laetrile in clinical trials. Because in case you don't remember, clinical trials are done after animal tests to look for a smooth transition between this treatment from the lab to the hospital. Not everything that shows promise in a lab will be smooth in a trial. Anyway, I'm quite done with this video. If you enjoyed, subscribe for more content like this. Otherwise, don't, I guess.